Good afternoon and welcome to the David Muir Lecture Series. I'm Kezia Dugdale and I'm the Director of the John Smith Centre. As your MC today, it's my job to introduce the centre and our guest David Muir and Teddy Goff, both joining us from the States, so good morning to you both. The John Smith Centre exists to make the positive case for politics and public service. And we try and do that in three key ways. We run groundbreaking internship and development programmes for young people in a way to try and break down the barriers that people face accessing public life. We do research, looking at the degree to which the public trust their politicians and their public servants. And we do it through advocacy and events, showcasing the very best of politics and public service. And today's guests are no exception to that rule. David Muir is the former director of strategy to Prime Minister Gordon Brown. He's a best-selling author and also has the best part of two decades worth of business experience in the field of global marketing. He has served as a visiting fellow at Harvard, currently serves on the advisory board of the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago, and crucially, and above all else, he's also on the board of the John Smith Centre here at the University of Glasgow. Teddy Goff is a co-founder and partner at Precision Strategies, a strategy and marketing agency where his partners are Stephanie Cutter and Jen O'Malley Dillon, who has just been appointed as Joe Biden's White House Deputy Chief of Staff in the past few days. Prior to Precision, Teddy was the digital director for President Obama's re-election campaign. He was also Hillary Clinton's chief digital strategist in 2016, where I first had the privilege of meeting him. Teddy, we're thrilled to have you with us today. And David, it's over to you. Thank you ever so much, uh, Kez, and um, uh, thank you, Teddy, uh, uh, for spending time with us uh, today. Um, I think it's best to kind of just get straight into the questions, and I encourage everybody who's on the call just to, to send us questions, and we'll make sure that, that, that Teddy answers them. The way I'd like to structure this is start by kind of looking at the campaign that's just, uh, just taken place. And then, you know, compare that to other experiences that, uh, and other races that Teddy, Teddy's worked on. And then finally, kind of uh, dig into Teddy's own personal story, which are a remarkable story, which I think hopefully um, uh, students on the call will find interesting and relevant as they think about their, their careers. So without much further ado, um, Teddy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something really invidious here. I'm going to ask you to to score Team Biden uh, versus um, uh, Team Trump and tell me how you come out of those scores. Now, I know you've got a little bit of a conflict of interest here. <laughs> your, your business partner, uh, Je General Ali Dillon, uh, ran uh, the Biden campaign. But if you can be as candid as you can and, and you know, say what you thought was really interesting about each of the campaigns or, or and, you know, talk us through what you think could have been done better. So I'll, I'll hand, over to, hand over to you with that. Hand grenade. <laughs> um, well, thanks, David, um, and everybody for uh, having me, and um, thanks to the students for taking time out of your afternoon to watch. Um, I think I've got two um, conflicts of interest here. One is that I can't criticize Jenna Malley Dillon, and the other is that I can't compliment um, Donald Trump. So both of those, <laughs> uh, you know, make this a tough question for me. Um, I think obviously you have to give extremely high marks to the Biden campaign um, because I mean they won, but you know I, I think they they pulled off. Um, some pretty nifty um, things in the course of winning, and winning by a lot. As I, I'm, I'm, I imagine, everyone who's on this call is on this or on this um, Zoom is on the Zoom in part because um, you follow American politics. So you know you probably know um, a whole lot about this, including that we count votes very, very slowly, especially in blue states, and also um, people who vote by mail are more likely to be Democrats, which makes um, Democratic votes come in even more slowly. So. You know, um, Biden's lead continues to tick up, and um, it really won't have been all that close in the end. Um, you know, and it, it really wasn't that close in Pennsylvania, notwithstanding the near death experience of that Tuesday night. Um, and, you know, was close in Wisconsin and, um, and, and Michigan, but not that close, and, and um, you know, substantially less close than it was four years ago when, um, when Trump won. You know, I think um, when it comes to the Biden campaign, I'm, I'm impressed by a, a couple of things. You know, I think they um, they pulled they really pulled off a, an interesting um, accomplishment when it comes to their message. You know, I think when I think about what happened to us four years ago with Hillary, um, it was um, damn near impossible to speak to undecided voters, try to peel off some um, Republicans who weren't that happy with Donald Trump without absolutely alienating or just flat out pissing off the left. And one of the things I think is so interesting about the Biden operation is that you really didn't 
see a lot of anger from the left. In fact, I mean, you know, when I looked at, you know, Twitter and talked to my own, you know, sort of Bernie supporting friends and things like that, they were all, um, you know, not exactly um, inspired by Biden, but perfectly happy to vote for him and in many cases donate or, um, or go make calls. I think part of that is because we've lived with Trump for four years and that was um, a harrowing experience much more than um, observing his candidacy. But I, but I think, you know, B Biden and his team were, were exceptionally disciplined in staying out of the kinds of traps that would have made the left, um, you know, throw a fit and refuse to support him. Um, so I think that's one of the things I'm really interested in about what they did. And I think that's a really important issue for us going forward. We'll probably get into it later, but you know, we've, we've got to, as a party, figure out how to um, do nothing to alienate or, you know, or, 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 or push off um, you know, the people who want to defund the police and the people who are for the Green New Deal and Medicare for All, which I'm among, by the way, while also not, you know, scaring off these, um, these moderates or, or these, um, you know, these sort of, um, you know, swing, swing voters who are, who are horrified by those or, you know, literally scared by those opinions. So anyway, that's one. Um, I think the organization itself um, and the organizing effort um, was pretty spectacular. And again, I think to some degree they benefited from the environment. Um, you know, people really wanted Trump gone, really, really wanted Trump gone. But it doesn't follow from that that they were definitely going to have a massive you know, calling operation uh, toward the end in some areas, a massive door knocking operation. Obviously that was hamstrung by COVID to a high degree. Um, and it, it certainly didn't follow from that that they would have raised quite as much money online as they did. In fact, if, if you'd asked me in um, March when he became the presumptive nominee, if I thought he'd raise anywhere near the amount of money he wound up raising from the amount of people he, he wound up raising it from, I, I would have, my guess would have been far below what the actual numbers were even assuming that there was the lift produced by the absolute, you know, um, fear and 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 contempt for Donald Trump. So um, maybe we'll have time to get into what that actually looked like tactically. But I think that's a massive achievement. Um, and then, you know, I, I think um, in the past couple of days, there's been a, a profile of the chief analytics officer, and um, you know, certainly there's been profiles of Jen. Um, you know, I think they had a very clear understanding of what their states were, and they stuck to that. And um, you know, I think, yeah, they dabbled in Texas a little bit, you know, um, I don't, I, I'd be a little surprised if they ever thought they were really going to win that, but it was a, you know, investment, especially given that they had all that money that they sort of had to find somewhere to put. But, you know, I, I spoke to, um, a senior, I'm not going to, um, uh, betray his confidences, but a senior, um, Biden official, uh, who told me that, um, you know, he, he woke up on election day with exactly the map that they wound up, um, you know, that, that wound up being the map. Uh, including Nebraska too, excluding Florida and of course Ohio and Iowa, including the narrow winds in uh, Georgia and the upper Midwest states and and Arizona. So you know, I and I think that the spending and the travel bears that out. So you know, yeah. I think overall they did a really good job. Um, um, you know, sort of. Um, not being affected by the media narrative. You know, if you remember back in May and June, you could not open up a newspaper or turn on a TV without coming across some, you know, gray beard of the Democratic Party second guessing them and saying that Biden had to get out of his basement and saying there was no strategy. And, you know, I, I, I think they had a strategy all along. I think keeping Biden in the basement was a good strategy and part of that strategy. Um, I, I think they knew exactly what their states were. Um, they avoided the um, pitfalls that come with the, you know, the current, um, you know, sort of hyperpolarized discourse and um, all the problems that can come with, um, you know, the left and then on the other side, the center and the right. And, um, you know, never wavered. You never really saw big strategic shifts. You never saw staff turnover, you know, and, and they just, um, you know, sort of ran their play and, and, um, and it worked. Um, you know, Trump. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of compliments for Trump. I mean, I think when it comes to Trump, um, it's funny. For four years, I've, I've I've really basically avoided calling him the president. And I just call him Trump. But now I sort of like the sound of the words "outgoing president." So I've started calling him the outgoing president. You know, if you look at if you look at the outgoing president himself, I think that's a man with no capacity for strategic thinking whatsoever. Um, I do think that he has a gut feel and certain gut instincts that, not because he's so strategic, but because he's lucky and a product of American culture sync up with American culture to some degree. So he's racist. So are many Americans, you know, he's nativist and protectionist and so are many Americans. So, you know, I, I think, you know, there's, there's no strategic thinking there, but there are, you know, emanations from the rotten gut of Donald Trump that can appeal to some people and, and have broader appeal than 
some Democrats might have thought, um, you know, certainly four years ago, but even this year, as we saw, really massive turnout for him. So we'll probably get back to that. But, you know, I think to, to the degree that this election was closer than it might have looked, it's it's not, it's because turnout was so high, you know, it's it, or closer than you might have thought going in. It's because there was a sort of a wave for Trump. There was just a bigger wave for, um, you know, for Biden. But there, there was really a wave for Trump. And I think he got 10 million more votes this time than he got last time. So, you know, he has a a set of instincts and a style that um, that while I firmly believe are not really governed by a political strategy, you know, are uh, appealing to a horrifying um, number of Americans. I think his team, um, you know, did some did some smart um, stuff. Um, not not quite enough, you know. I think, um, and and it's 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 very hard to assess that operation because what the team is doing is so much at odds with what is coming out of you know Trump's Twitter yeah. account and Trump's mouth. You know, I think. Um, Trump, I think, you know, if he is capable of any strategic thought whatsoever, I think he believes that the only way to win is to rally the base. There is no real undecided voters. Um, there's no point in pretending to be a moderate or, um, you know, putting on a show about doing something about COVID. You know, you may as well just, you know, talk about firing Fauci and there's maybe more voters to be had um, there than if you pretend that you're working well with Fauci. Um, and he may or may not be right about that. And then he also obviously has no ability to work with Fauci. So his, um, you know, it's, a, a, again, he's sort of um, a, a prisoner of his own um, low character. I think the team though, um, you know, ran, a, ran a, a, a decent campaign under the circumstances. You know, I think, um, I, I, I think I'm of the view that COVID uh, probably didn't hurt Trump as much as we might've thought. And I think in particular, People are um, absolutely sick of lockdowns, um, and um, you know, to the extent I think when they hear Biden say we're going to handle COVID, I think Trump made them think what what Biden means by that is is going to be a lockdown, maybe till there's a vaccine, and you know, so I think, I think obviously Trump would have would have done himself a favor if he had appeared to take it seriously, recommended that people wear masks, etc. But I think he he actually sort of successfully fought that issue to a draw. I think. Or, or, or even, you know, found some voters who were afraid that what that, you know, the Biden plan meant, you know, sit at home for six months and don't spend Christmas with your family. Um, and I think kind of going along with that, um, you know, if you look at what the actual TV ads were in the, in the last um, stages, they were talking about Biden raising taxes, um, you know, and they were talking about Biden sending America back into a, into a complete lockdown. And, you know, I think, and I don't mean this as a critique per se. I mean, they won the election quite handily, but I, but I do think that, um, you know, by contrast, the, the Biden team w wasn't talking economically to the degree you might have thought. I mean, you know, four years ago, I think the overwhelming consensus in the sort of postmortems was, you know, Hillary made it all about character and Trump's crudeness. And, um, you know, I think Biden, you know, sort of interestingly did the same, you know, um, you know, talked about the character of the country and the soul of the nation was his phrase. And so I think, you know, Trump, um, at least the Trump campaign, um, stayed focused on the economy, you know, made a boogeyman out of the Biden tax plan. Obviously, they were lying about it and made a boogeyman out of the Biden um, COVID plan. And I think, um, you know, weren't able to win the election and probably didn't persuade almost anyone, but did, um, you know, drive up, um, you know, voters, 10 million more voters than they found um, last time. So, you know, I think it's it's hard to, you can't, I don't think you can be a Democrat and, and, and look at that operation and think they're a bunch of morons. I think their boss, I think the outgoing president is a moron, but I think I think they, um, you know, they, they did some things that are worth um, taking note of, for sure. And in terms of, uh, and on that point, I mean, what, what were some of the digital innovations that you saw from that team that you think are quite interesting? And we've got a, we've got a question about, you know, why the Democrats didn't, um, uh, didn't take Florida. Do you think they were able to harness digital technology in order to, you know, micro-target you know, particular groups, you know, you, you on the Hillary campaign had a great night in Miami-Dade, you know, the Biden campaign had a bad night in Miami-Dade. So to what to what extent do you think kind of digital innovation and creativity may, may have actually helped, uh, you know, Trump and uh, the Trump campaign to that extent? Well, that's a that's a difficult question. You know, in in the, the, the Biden campaign was was fully resourced, you know, and so when you think about Micro-targeting, you're thinking about two things. One, you're thinking about can you avoid wasting money on yeah. voters you don't need to spend money on. 
uh, either because they're in your camp or they're not in your camp. And for the Biden campaign, obviously, they would have been trying not to waste money. But that was actually less of a concern because they were looking for places to spend money, frankly. So, you know, they're, they're um, you know, ads can produce a backlash effect, which is a very important thing. So, you know, you have to be concerned about that. But, you know, fundamentally, I think um, that element of micro-targeting of not wasting money um, was, you know, was less important in this environment where they were raising more money. You know, more money was coming in on a daily basis than they could send out the door with even halfway decent, you know, media placements or um, or inventory. So, you know, I think um, the other element of micro-targeting is, you know, going off the backlash thing is, you know, saying the right things to the right people. Um, you know, that's that's a very very tricky business in part because, as we all know, and I, I presume you spoke about this last week with Joel. Um, you know, our, our um, measurement, um, you know, technologies and techniques are, um, are pretty weak. And to me, that's the single biggest shortcoming in American politics. I mean, I'll, I'll come back to your question, but just as a little aside, you know, for me, when I woke up, what is it, two, two Wednesdays ago, I, I knew Biden had it won. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't too nervous about that. I was bummed about the Senate. But as a practitioner, I was so down and out about the polling thing because I just thought, you know, show me an athlete who'd be willing to play a sport where you don't know if you're up five, tied, or down five. You know, you'd yeah. you'd quit that sport and find a different sport. You know, that's no fun and no fair, and you can't make good strategic decisions under that condition. You know, that's something I've I've, I've said about the Clinton campaign always. You know, the fact that that we went into the final stages thinking that we you know had a had a healthy lead in those upper Midwest states and probably a six or seven point lead nationally doesn't make you complacent in the sense that everyone's calling it a day at 5 p.m. and hitting the bar, but it makes you think that you don't need to change your strategy because you yeah. believe that you're about to win. If you believe that you're tied, you are thinking about things entirely differently. So, yeah. you know, I think, um, I think our measurement uh, um, um, techniques are, are a real debacle, um, you know, that make the country even more ungovernable than it, than it is. I mean, how can you run a political system where every four years it's an utter nail biter and, and you know, with an unexpected outcome half the time? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's sort of untenable. And so the same goes for messaging and creative. I think we don't, ha we don't even, even at, at this late stage with, you know, all the money and all the technological advancements, we don't know what works as well as we might think. Um, and it's a tricky um, problem because, um, you know, you can't really, you know, to figure out what works, you know, it, when you're talking about fundraising or organizing, you're getting actions. You can figure out what works there. You know, if I'm sending out a fundraising email, this one raises a million dollars, this one raises $900,000, the first was better. You know, yeah. when you're talking about persuasion, people don't necessarily know if they've changed their minds or why they've changed their minds or if they're going to stick to where they landed after changing their minds or maybe just flip it back. And so all of the tools you have to figure out what the message ought to be are based to some degree on self-reporting. You know, are you more or less likely to vote for Biden because you've seen this ad or heard this message um, and, and are done in a research environment rather than an actual real world environment where, you know, when you see a TV ad or a digital ad, you know, you've got one eye on the screen, you've got one eye on the, you know, the soup pot that you're make, cooking up for dinner, and you've just seen a, a Trump ad before and after, and it changes the whole um, experience of it. So, you know, I, I just think it's it's a depressing and and a matter of really urgent further exploration that we don't exactly know what works. And so, you know, when you talk about um, Miami Dade, you know. Um, n no Democrat thinks that um, Latinos are a monolith. I mean, this is like this, it's almost a joke how this is like everyone's saying Latinos are not a monolith. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that Cuban Americans and Venezuelan Americans are less likely to be Democrats than Puerto Rican Americans or, or Puerto Ricans or Dominican Americans or, uh, or Mexican Americans. Um, but it doesn't follow from that that we know exactly what to do about that. Uh, and, you know, that's another matter for really urgent exploration because I'm not ready to give up on Florida. Many Democrats are, but I think that would be an absolute uh, mistake. You know, you're talking about a state that we lose by one or two. You know, I'd rather give up on Iowa and Ohio, which we tend to lose by eight or nine and which are smaller. Um, in terms of, so in terms of digital innovation, you know, I think, um, the, the interesting stuff, I think this time, everybody always talks about micro-targeting. I think the conversation around that is a bit um, fanciful. I don't, I don't think people, I don't think it means what people think it means. I don't, I don't think um, Trump in 16 had the capabilities that they thought. And I don't, you know, I, I think um, that's not exactly where I would pin the conversation around digital innovation. I think um, that there was a lot of digital organizing innovation. You know, I mean, you had a campaign um, that had to do almost all of its organizing online, you know, um, and the numbers around text banking, you know, which is like a phone bank, except you're texting people were 
out of this world, you know? Um, I think um, digital content, you know, I mean, Biden's events were basically like this. Um, and a lot of them were really good. And the Democratic Convention was like this and was great, you know? So I think that's where there was innovation. And then I think, um, you know, there was also uh, a lot of work and I think it's, it's um, uh, it remains to be seen how effective it was. I'm not calling that into question. I'm just saying I, I, I'm intrinsically skeptical of press reports because I think, you know, campaigns can talk about how smart they were and we have no idea if they move votes or not. But I think there was a lot of, lot of work done around disinformation and, and fighting disinformation um, that was um, really important. You know, I hope it worked and hopefully we'll find m more about that out, you know, in the coming months. Um, but that's an important, you know, sort of um, skill set for our party to have. So those are the areas, organizing content and, you know, sort of um, the information warfare stuff that I think uh, where I think we saw a lot of um, cool stuff done this cycle. Yeah. So I want to I want to uh, dig into one of those in particular. Um, so your other business partner, uh, Stephanie Cutter, um, it, it, it played a kind of key role in in creating a kind of conference on you know a, you know kind of conference online. Can you can you talk us through the kind of thinking you know that that, that was involved amongst Stephanie and the team about how they approach that, how the content had to be different, because it can't just sure, be like- Yeah, I mean, I you know, really so, so it's um, funny, I'm, I'm, I'm very much the run to the litter because Jen ran the campaign and Stephanie ran the convention and I just ran the business to the, to the best of my ability. <laughs> uh, um, you know, so Stephanie had been appointed um, a, a, program, a program executive, I think is the title, prior to COVID. And so, you know, I don't know how many people watching this have seen a Democratic convention, but it's typically four days. They're all day affairs. There's a couple hours that are um, on, um, on primetime, tele you know, broadcast television. Um, the rest of it you can catch on C-SPAN or on the live stream. Um, you know, every mayor and delegate gets, you know, two minutes and there's all kinds of, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, you have, there's a rules committee and a platform committee and lots and lots of breakout meetings. It's a convention that they sort of try to jerry rig into a television event to the best of their yeah. um, ability. So, you know, COVID happens as we all remember um, in, you know, late February, early March. Um, and so, um, you know, I remember there were a couple of weeks where it wasn't altogether clear that there couldn't be an in-person convention. And then, you know, by late March or something that becomes clear. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden the, the, the task is to produce, um, you know, a four, a four day streaming television show um, for two hours a night, um, you know, which, isn't all that different from what you do anyway, because, if, you know, of course, as you're putting together the in-person convention, you're, you're, you're first and foremost worried about those who are not in the building, but, you know, you just have to think about formats and, and, and you know, and how you make, any, how you make this interesting. And, um, you know, and I think they made it more interesting than the ordinary ones are. I mean, you know, I, I think probably everyone agrees with that. I think they made a really smart decision to make it two hours per night. Um, historically, the primetime um, segment is three hours per night. Um, you know, that's just really long and, um, you know, um, and it just, it means um, you can um, give more people more time and um, that feels great for the speaker, but doesn't feel all that great for the viewer, I think. And so, you know, I think that's a key decision that forced them to be really choosy about who even got a spot. I know they had to have really difficult conversations with senators and former cabinet secretaries and people who were really great, but who just, you know, weren't going to make it into that eight hour, um, you know, four night event. Um, and they had to be, uh, you know, they kept these speeches to five minutes, seven minutes, where whatever, you know, whereas in the past, they might have been 30 minutes. So, you know, I think that's just sort of a, a, a structural thing that was um, smart and to their um, advantage. And then, you know, they, um, you know, they sort of innovated, you know, I think the speeches were by and large what they were, they were all very well done. And there was a theme for each night and so forth. Um, so, um, you know, and instead of seeing someone at a rostrum in, in a stadium, you're seeing them in their living room or whatever it may have been. But then I think around the speeches is where they just did really cool stuff. So the one that I think got everyone's attention was the roll call. I don't know how many of you remember this, David, I assume you do. It's, a, it's, it's, one, it's part of the pomp and circumstance of every um, convention where the states have to, where a, a member of each state's delegation says who their um, delegation's votes are going to. And they say, you know, from Illinois, the proud home of Abraham Lincoln, we give our 65 delegates to, you know, Joe Biden or whatever. And so typically that's, uh, that's like a big scrum on the floor of the stadium and it's a big mess. And this time you had 50 or actually, you know, we have territories, uh, so 50, you know, 60 or whatever it is, people 
from their home states or territories with these beautiful backdrops, you know, showing a little bit of the culture of their state, um, you know, um, doing that remotely. And I think that was like so fun for people. It was like a little, it was almost like a travel show, you know? And yeah. so this thing that nobody enjoys that they do in the middle of the day in a usual convention, because it's not worth being on prime time, they turned into this sort of like one hour travel show where you're meeting all these people and seeing these beautiful backdrops and national parks and local food and stuff like that. And I think that was cool. Um, the other one that comes to mind is they did a video that if you watched, you may remember of a, of a young person with a stutter and um, Joe Biden sort of famously is a stutterer or is a recovering stutterer, has overcome his stutter, whatever it is. And, um, you know, this kid was just so sweet. And, um, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, that, that's the sort of video that a campaign might make and put out on, you know, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, um, you know, might be shown on the Jumbotron at the event, but probably isn't going to be, you know, in the primetime slot because you're giving that to speakers. And so I think the core, you know, I think I think they started from, a, you know, this sort of core question of, you know, how do we, we there's some business we've got to get done, you know, Biden's got to speak, Harris has got to speak, the Obamas are going to speak, the Clintons are going to speak, you know, what can we do around that to make this feel, you know, not like you're, you know, watching a, a lousy live stream of, a, of an in-person event that you're not invited to, but rather a made for TV and made for streaming event. And that's, I think, what what gave them these ideas, like, like those couple of uh, ones I just mentioned. And it was awesome. And I'd be surprised if we ever... I mean, we'll meet in person in four years, I assume, but I think the the primetime program will look a lot more like this year's. Yeah. And have you found, um, this is where my kind of marketing head kind of kicks in, have you have you found that commercial clients have kind of come to you and said, well, how did you, know, you did this kind of convention, could you do similar stuff for us or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I, 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 more should if you're watching. Just kidding. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, so we've had a couple, actually a couple international political parties and a, and a couple of corporations and then a couple of sort of event companies um, talk to us about about that question, you know, because their conference has to, um, you know, has to go online. So yeah, ab absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I'd be, I don't know what you think, David, or what others think, you know, I think, obviously, at some point, hopefully next year, we're all vaccinated. Um, but I think it's probably a long time till we get thousands of people together in, yeah. in big events. And then even, even once that's perfectly safe, I still think a lot of people are going to say, like, why would I, why would we bother? You know, it turns out you can do an, a, you know, you can have a meeting over zoom. You know, I have a client in, in, in California who I used to fly out there once a month for meetings. I, I might never see them in person again, you know, even post vaccine because everything's fine. You know, we can do, we can save ourselves a bunch of time and money. So I think, um, uh, my 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 hunch is that the digital conference, the Zoom conference, Zoom concert, Zoom whatever convention is is here to stay, even post vaccine, as a as a time saver and, and money saver. That's uh, really really interesting, Teddy. Um, I'm going to turn to so when you think about it, you've got the convention, then you've got the TV debates, which we'll come on to, and there's a very good question from Louis Dawson, um, who has a general question about you know what bearing do presidential debates have on the outcome and then a, a particularly good kind of sub question which is how are they used in the digital sphere and I think what would be interesting is to talk about I mean you you have sat in a campaign headquarters and kind of seen a kind of digital team respond in a tv debate so it'd be good if you could just you know um, help the students and other people on the call just kind of understand how you with the tv debates how you kind of kind of integrate that with your with your digital efforts as well yeah so i mean you know I, i'm of the view they don't um, make a huge difference i mean i think we saw hillary wipe the floor with trump in my opinion three times certainly everyone agrees twice out of the three times and it didn't make a difference and neither for, for that matter did the convention because the 16 convention was was unbelievably well done uh in my opinion um you know, I think um, they're a fundraising tool. You raise a ton of money. Um, you know, uh, every campaign does it now. You know, two seconds after it ends, you get an email saying, I've just walked off the debate stage and, you know, that kind of thing. And it's a big day for that. Same goes for organizing. You know, I think, um, you know, to me, it's sort of a do no harm event. You know, a bad debate can hurt you more than a good debate um, helps you. But even that, I think, um, you know, in an era of um, polarization and, and partisanship and, and very few people, um, you know, switching their votes. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, s s somewhat limited long-term, um, um, consequence in terms of how you do it. You know, um, 
you know, uh, camp, there's a whole team apart from the campaign that is working on debate prep and they're working on it for months. And then um, in the week or two before the um, debate, they begin to, um, you know, spend more and more time with the candidate. And, um, you know, so the candidate goes into a debate with obviously a strategy for that debate and a bunch of lines that they're hoping to deliver. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, you you work with the debate team to make sure that you know what those are and that there's a strategy for each of the sort of key, you know, knockout punches that you're hoping to deliver. And so, you know, you, you don't know how it's going to go because the question, you know, the candidate may get cold feet and not say the thing you hope they'd said, or maybe you've worked up a graphic and the candidate sort of garbles the words and it comes out wrong and you've got to redo the graphic or or whatever, but I mean, you're, you're trying to prepare as best you can based on what you understand the candidate is gonna go out there and, and do. And in an ideal case, you know, you, you, the candidate gets just the question that you're hoping they get, they deliver the line, you know, immediately, you've got a video or a graphic teed up for that, um, and, you know, and, and, and off it goes. I mean, I remember from 16, um, the, I, I think it was the first debate, um, Trump, um, uh, uh, Hillary, um, put Trump on the spot about one of the ordinary Americans that he'd used his Twitter account to harass this woman, Alicia Machado, um, who he had, um, who, yeah. you know, uh, who he had um, harassed. And, you know, we had a video about her story. And, you know, after the debate was over, rather than, you know, a, a more traditional res response, or, you know, just saying Hillary won, we put out our video about Alicia's story, which got like, 50 million views overnight and wow. the whole country was talking about Alicia for the next couple of, of days and it became the kind of sticky takeaway from that debate did not win us the election I must I must note um, so you know I think that's sort of the ideal um, case I think the other thing about debates is that there's this whole meta conversation around who won the debate and I think you know I, this is something I think the 2000 race sort of ages ago in political terms um, really sort of gelled for people you know people who watched the first debate between Bush and Gore, you know, the real time um, uh, focus groups and things like that indicated that Gore had won and the Bush campaign mounted this ridiculous um, effort to say that that Gore had been condescending and he kept sighing when, yes. when Bush spoke and he kept rolling his eyes at Bush. And so by two days later, the whole country had been sort of made to feel that that Gore was a real asshole, a condescending guy, and he'd sighed and rolled his eyes through the debate. And they really shifted, you know, and no one remembers what they said about the economy or what they said about, you know, um, the climate. And, um, you know, they're just sort of engaging in this meta conversation around who won. So the other thing the campaigns put, uh, you know, an almost absurd amount of effort into is sort of um, trying to win the fight over, um, you know, over, over who won. But I think even that is of declining importance because in the current environment, you know, we say we won, they say they won. The, the media says both sides think they won. And, and then, you know, a couple of days later, it's all pretty well forgotten about. Fascinating. Um, I've got a question here from um, Sean Walker, which I think is um, a really interesting one. Um, and he asked the question, which is, you know, to what extent do you think the kind of left needs to improve its storytelling ability? Um, he makes the point that the, the right uh, appears to be effective with very kind of simple, reductive narratives and how do you think the left um, can balance, you know, you know, can can get find a balance between the simplicity that they need in order to kind of win people over, over, but also um, with the depth that these topics, you know, deserve? Is that is that an argument that you buy or? Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of the key question for the future of <laughs> the Democratic Party. So I buy it, and Sean, if you have any ideas, you can. Um, DM me. Um, you know, I think it's it's difficult to answer that. I think one thing that I believe very firmly that I think makes me come across as like a rabid partisan, you know, liberal elite living here on the coast, and I guess guilty as charged. But I think um, I think um, one thing that sort of needs to that I think needs to be reckoned with as you then go answer that question is. Our voters are very different. You know, it's no, you know, the, the Republican base 
is more susceptible to simplistic messaging than the Democratic base is. And the Republican electeds are better at delivering simplistic messages than the Democratic electeds are. And I think that has to do with the psychology of why people become conservative or progressive in the, in the first place. You know, um, uh, progressivism thrives on nuance and, um, and, and, and um, you know, thrives on complexity in a way that conservatism, um, you know, simply doesn't. And I think you see that dynamic all around the world where, you know, as you've seen the, the rise of the, um, you know, the sort of far right, um, you know, sort of neo authoritarian or neo fascist in Brazil, in Hungary, um, um, in the UK, thankfully to a somewhat lesser degree or less successful degree, but not altogether unsuccessful. Um, the French far right, um, uh, Modi in India, you know, all of these people are, you know, quite like Trump in, in their, um, you know, kind of comportment and um, you know, capable of delivering a very simple us versus them message that their opposition just simply isn't interested in delivering. And so, you know, it's a matter of effectiveness, obviously, but it's also a matter of sort of ethics and philosophy and, and like the wiring of our brains. And so I think if we were, you know, I, I've always thought, you know, there, it's, no, um, it's no coincidence that we never had, I don't know if everyone here will know these references, but that we never had a Rush Limbaugh of the left and we never had a Fox News of the left. Certainly MSNBC isn't that. And we never had a Breitbart of the left. It's because our people are not looking for that. And I can, I can, I can get into that. So I think, um, you know, it's not simply that we have a bunch of idiots who can't, you know, write a message or make an ad that's simple. It's that we're playing a very different game with our voters. That said, I agree with the premise that we need to get better because the fact of the matter is we have a Republican Party that's trying to do no good for anybody. You know, I mean, no good for anybody, and they should lose these elections 90-10, and yet they win an awful lot of them. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I, I want to go back and just read the phrasing of the question, just so I'm, I'm making sure that I'm um, that I'm answering it. Um, you know, I think, um, look, I, I think there's a couple of things here. You know, um, to some degree, I think this is a question of policy. You know, I think I'm not a huge fan of the sort of watered down, we often say neoliberal, although I think that's one of those terms that people throw at anything they think is bad. So it's sort of a, a, a term that, you know, may not really mean anything anymore. But, you know, when, you know, Trump is out there saying, um, you know, build a wall, immigrants are bad, you know, whatever, you know, all, all, all this stuff, it's, 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 it's not complicated. And, you know, there's talk that the president elect is gonna cancel student debt, but only up to ten thousand dollars, and only for people in a certain income bracket, and only if the debt is um, private, and not fe not not federal. Yeah, it's it's hard to deliver that message simply because it is not a simple message. Right. Um, and so I think part of this is, you know, we shouldn't um, retrofit what we actually believe in to suit, um, you know, to, to to make them Twitter length. But we should we do have to understand, you know, there's a reason that AOC is so, um, you know, so effective. Um, you know, part of it is that she's clever and she's so captivating and, and char charismatic. Part of it is she doesn't water down her beliefs. You know, the Green New Deal, that's three words. Not everyone knows exactly what's in it, but it's three words. And you don't have to bend yourself into a pretzel to say everything that it's not, or it only goes up to a certain income level or whatever. You know, Medicare for all, three words for all. You know, it's quite simple. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think her, her effectiveness has to do with her actual um, policy position. So, you know, there's been a raging debate over the past couple of weeks um, between her and Connor Lamb. Uh, uh, is this going to ring a bell for anyone on the on the Zoom? You think? Why, why don't you Why don't you explain? Oh. So, oh, oh, uh, AOC represents a kind of deep blue um, uh, congressional district um, just north of where Teddy and I are in the in the Bronx and Queens, um, and Connor Lamb. Um, uh, is a very interesting uh, a congressman who took in a by-election, as we would say in the UK, um, a deep, deep, deep um, Trump constituency. So when it was, uh, that's the bit of background, and then over to you. So, so after the election, AOC came out and said a bunch of stuff that I mostly agree with, you know, the Democrats underinvest in digital, I mean, she's talking about money, but also, you know, as a mindset and just exactly what your question is, you know, you can't tell stories and can't communicate on social media. And Connor Lamb um, gave an interview to, to, you know, sort of directly push back on AOC and said, you know, in, in my district, which is a Trump district, or I think it was still a Trump district this time, you yeah. know, where he did, he did win re-election, but by a narrow amount. You know, I can't be out there talking about the Green New Deal. And, you know, I'd get, I, you know, um, many Democrats think that the defund the police movement 
damn near killed them or in some cases did help make them lose their uh, elections. You know, in my district, I can't talk about that stuff. You know, I've got to be talking about stuff that's not going to go viral, stuff that's not sexy, you know, um, uh, stuff that's, um, uh, you know, talk about infrastructure, talk about um, veterans affairs, talk about, you know, um, lowering tax cuts for working families. And, you know, I think, um, I think he's not, I think he's not wrong. Um, you know, I think um, Democrats need to invest in digital across the board. That's something we have not been good at. We've gotten a little better about it this cycle than we've been in past cycles, but it's pathetic. I'm not even talking about the presidential level. At the down ballot level, Republicans tend to outspend Democrats uh, on Facebook and Google until this election cycle, sometimes four to one, five to one, while we Seriously? put all, all our money into TV. So that has to do with who's making decisions and the age of our candidates, which everyone I think um, knows and and who the who the top consultants are and and just what the sort of best practices are. So we need to invest more in digital money wise. Um, but then I do think we need to, you know, like learn how to tell stories and um, and, you know, um, build up social media followings and actually inspire people. The problem, though, is that, um, you know, social media is not exactly a level playing field. You know, um, if you're saying uh, Green New Deal and Medicare for all, you're going to find a big following and, and be absolutely inspiring. And, you know, as sickening as it is, and I, I think we, we should pressure the companies to change this, but if you're saying build a wall and, you know, um, you know, black people are bad, you're going to find a big following there too. And it's very, very difficult. It's in fact impossible to, to you know, go viral um, when it comes to, uh, you know, if you're saying, you know, let's reduce the top marginal tax rate by a little bit and, you yeah. know, let's, um, you know, let's cancel student debt, but only up to $10,000 for non-federal loans. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, we face a, we face a tricky um, problem as a party. Um, you know, we can't run AOC everywhere as much as I personally love her. She would lose in a whole lot of places. Um, but the the places where, you know, where someone like Connor Lamb is our best um, bet to win, um, you know, he's going to um, have a big problem on social media, you know, a big, big, big problem. And Joe Biden is going to have a big problem on social media because he's not going to be out there saying um, Green New Deal. And so he's going to be taking it from from the left. He's obviously going to be taking it from the far right. And he's going to be trying to, to push through a sort of center left moderate agenda through an intractable, through an intransigent Congress, but also in a social media environment where his kinds of messages aren't going to inspire people, no matter how good the storytelling is, or aren't going to inspire people as much as the farther left and far right stuff are going to do. Okay. That, that's fascinating. I've got a, another really good um, uh, question here, which kind of, I, I want to I'll ask the specific question from Louise Burns, but I just want to kind of set it up. I mean, you, you had firsthand experience. You didn't just battle against the, 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 Trump, uh, the, the Trump team in 2016. You actually had to deal with um, a, a full blown disinformation campaign by a state, um, i.e. the Russians. Um, you know, to what, to what extent do you think kind of disinformation you know, played a role in 2016? And do you think it had the same role in 2020 um, uh, or were the Democrats better able to com combat it? And then the kind of third component of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Louise Burns's um, uh, question, which is excellent. What is your opinion of the Republican campaign mobilizing voters indirectly on the basis of QAnon conspiracy movement? And do you think it's had an impact on the election outcome? So it'd be great if you could start with your own personal, you know, you were literally in the trenches kind of dealing um, with the disinformation campaign to what extent you think it was still relevant in 2020 and then answer Lou, Louise's excellent question. Mm -hmm. And keep the questions coming, by the way, everybody. Yeah, the questions have been great. Um, much better than when I've done these sorts of things in America. So <laughs> I don't know what that says. Uh, so gosh, I mean, you know, I think it's useful to go back to the Obama experience, you know, um, and and how it misled us, I think, in 16, and then what happened in, you know, just, just this month. Um, you know, uh, with, uh, with, with President Obama back to when he was candidate Obama, Senator Obama, you know, there, there was the, the Muslim smear. And, you know, it's important always to say, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with being a Muslim. He just doesn't happen to be one. And, and that, was, that was weaponized as a smear against him by people who do think it's bad to be a Muslim. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Um, so, you know, from the early days of his rise as a national figure, people were saying, you know, he wasn't actually a Christian. And obviously Donald Trump was out there saying he um, wasn't born in the U.S. And 
you know, this was when social media was a whole different thing, you know, in the relatively early days of social media, if you're talking about 07, you know, Facebook is around, but it's basically used by young people. Imagine that, you know, the young people on the call may not even know there was a time when Facebook was used by young people. Um, you know, Twitter was not uh, uh, in, in wide usage whatsoever. Instagram wasn't around yet. So uh, very early um, days. So, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, a, a misinformation that's being passed, you know, like by literal word of mouth, actual human mouth speaking to one another, or, you know, to some degree channeled, um, you know, on right wing talk radio and things like that. And, you know, there was a pretty aggressive effort in both 08 and 12 to combat, um, you know, to combat the, the, the Muslim thing and the, um, and the birther thing. Um, but we also saw quite clearly that they never sort of broke out of a small ish proportion of you know, right wing crazies who weren't gonna, um, you know, who weren't gonna vote for us. And we actually sort of thought that the more time they waste on that stuff, the less time they're talking about the economy, the less time they're talking about healthcare, the less time they're talking about foreign policy. And so I'm not saying we welcomed it, we didn't. And, you know, there were lots and lots of meetings and anxiety over what to do about this stuff. And we did, you know, put lots of information out there and do our best to recruit people to go forward emails to their friends and say, no, it's not true and stuff like that. Um, uh, you always have to worry that you're giving it more oxygen when you do that. So there's a lot of kind of psychology that goes into how do you call something a lie without inadvertently reminding people that they heard it in the first place and, and all of that stuff. But like I said, we didn't welcome it, but it, it was it was it was manageable. It never broke out of, you know, 20 percent of the public. And, you know, we thought made the other 80 percent think these guys are kind of nuts. And, you know, also was just time not spent talking about the economy on their part. Well, we could be out there talking about the economy. You know, in, I think that um, sense of confidence was was based in part uh, on a media environment and a social media environment that had totally changed by 16, and in part on the fact that Barack Obama is one particular individual who people just don't think that bad stuff about. I mean, obviously many people do, but you know, 55 or 60 percent of the country, including a good five or 10 percent of people who didn't vote for him see him as a good and admirable man and and it's just hard you know that that stuff didn't stick to him in quite the same way that it stuck to hillary clinton and so um you know i think in hillary you had a person who you know had 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 elicited contempt from a, a huge swath of the country for you know almost 30 years um who had you know i, I um, you know who had who had made some choices that that kind of um played into the worst you know fears and 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 impressions of those people you know the email thing being the most um obvious and then you know you had a social media environment that by 2016 is is it's totally different where um you know facebook has basically um not only given up on trying to um create a, a healthy and non-toxic um platform but has actually made you know, um, algorithmic technological decisions to, 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 to juice the toxicity because that which is toxic is also electric and interesting. And, you know, so you saw things, especially on Facebook, to some degree on Twitter and YouTube, and again, right wing talk radio and Breitbart and places like that. And then all of that winds up back in, 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 you know, in social media. And so it all sort of feeds itself. Um, you know, but the, um, you know, the, the decision to sort of optimize for engagement while it makes sense for a business, uh, from a business perspective, you know, also meant that, um, you know, lock her up or, um, you know, um, she's engaged in a, um, you know, a sex trafficking ring and all the other nutty stuff that was going on there, um, you know, actually had more efficacy on Facebook than, you know, than her talking about her plan for, um, you know, for jobs. And, um, sorry, go ahead. Is that, is that right? It, it, that had more vira virality to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, by far. And so, you know, there were some reports which, which have been disputed that the Trump campaign got better ad rates um, than the Clinton campaign on Facebook, which is because ad rates, too, are to some degree a product of engagement. And, um, and, and so, you know, um, you know, him saying build the wall and lock her up is going to engage his, his people and his targets way more than her targeting uh, persuadable voters with a plan to, you know, for, for, for economic development. So, yeah. So, I mean, in, in every way, that particular ecosystem advantages the more incendiary, the more, um, um, the more, um, you know, and, and, you know, the more toxic, you know, the more crazy making. Um, and I think campaigns um, 
we're left really defenseless to that, in part because we can't shape Facebook's decisions and you can't put a genie back in the bottle. So, you know, um, you know, if, 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 if the whole country has heard that Hillary is corrupt and the Clinton campaign is, and, and Facebook me, makes sure that the first thing you see when you log on is that Hillary is corrupt. And by the way, you may have logged on because you got a notification that it's your grandkid's birthday, but that, yeah. the first thing you actually see is that Hillary is corrupt. And there's the Clinton campaign saying, no, she's not corrupt. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not a fight you can, you can win. And so, you know, I, I think to some degree campaigns are, are a bit defenseless. It's also a different kind of skill set than campaign operatives have, have historically been trained to have. So that's something that needs to change and is changing. But, you know, if you're someone who, you know, grew up, you know, making videos and writing tweets and, you know, or raising money or knocking on doors or, you know, that was sort of your political education, you know, you, you don't know how to do information warfare and, um, you know, and um, how to counter radical extremism and, and, and what goes into that. You know, that stuff you may learn at the CIA or, you know, in, in a whole different, you know, um, part of the professional world. And so, you know, I think um, the Clinton campaign, I think, was quite defenseless. I think the deck was stacked against it due to the mechanics of Facebook and, and the media. I think the mainstream media is not without... Um, blame here because I think they became unwitting allies of the people trying to peddle this sort of misinformation. Um, and I think within the Clinton campaign, you had a bunch of people who know how to write a good message and make a good ad, but 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 have no idea what the best practice is when it comes to you know again countering countering extremism are or information warfare. Um, and um, it went um, you know it went the way it went. Um, you know this time I think the the Biden campaign um did not want to get taken down by you know by some sort of you know right wing sludge you know rumor about um about biden i think they had a better de um you know deck of cards to play with because biden wasn't quite as vulnerable to that kind of stuff there was the hunter thing but the hunter thing was so baroque you know yeah. ukraine oil company there was some prosecutor was fired it's very you know it didn't have the simplicity of private email server she's up to something shady um yeah. Uh, and also it was about the son, not him. And, you know, people know the son has had a very difficult life. You know, there was just reasons why I just think that wasn't destined to take off. And then as with Obama, Biden is someone who, you know, most of the country kind of likes, you know, when I say most, I, I wish I meant 80% and I don't, I mean 55, but, you know, to a majority of people, he seems like a good person, a, a, a you know, a person of dignity and, and, you know, it, it, the stuff just doesn't stick to him in the same way, mm -hmm. but they also had a, had a program that I hope gets more, attention in the press, I'm sure it will, and I, I alluded to it earlier, to actually fight this stuff. And so they, I, I don't want to mischaracterize it, and I wasn't involved with it, but my understanding is that what they what they did was, you know, um, track these rumors and track misinformation, the Hunter thing and whatever else they were tracking. Um, instead of just freaking out about every single thing, they had a, a, a technique for measuring which ones were actually having an impact on voters and who, and were they the voters, were they persuadable voters uh, or demobilizable voters, you know, people who may or may not vote, or were they just right-wing people yeah. who were just having fun with this? And if it's something else tomorrow, it's something else tomorrow. So they had a pretty sophisticated measurement um, program to see which of these actually matter to them. And then they would test, um, they would test counter strategies. And I don't know what all they tested. I imagine it was a mix of trying to change the subject altogether versus trying to say, no, that's not true versus trying to say, actually, Trump is the one who's corrupt. Um, and then they would deploy these, um, these counter strategies to the specific cohorts of people who, they're, who they had measured could be influenced by these rumors. And so, you know, and, and you know, would they have won the election without that? I, you know, I don't know, maybe not, you know, but I think, I think that is, that is the, that is one thing to do. And I think there's other things that we need to do about misinformation. I think working the refs, making sure the media doesn't inadvertently um, um, carry this stuff forward is another. I think maybe most importantly, we've got to put pressure on the social media companies to change the way they operate and, and you know, like get QAnon out of there. So I'll get to the question <laughs> finally. Uh, and, um, um, you know, and, and, you know, I think, I, I do fundamentally think if we're we are going to lose every fight. It doesn't mean we lose every election, but we are going to lose every fight over misinformation if it's out there and we're out there saying, no, 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 that's not true. So I think we've got to put pressure on the, on the social media companies and the mainstream media to not let it get out there so far. Um, but, um, you know, in the meantime, um, you know, that, that may be a fight. That itself may be a fight we can't win. In the meantime, we've, um, you know, got to get better at, at, at saying, no, that's not true to the best of our ability. Um, 
As for QAnon, uh, I think Louise was the questioner. I mean, obviously, I have a very low opinion of the Republicans, um, you know, sort of dog whistle embrace of that um, of that stuff. I do think it matters um, tremendously. I mean, first of all, not to be too, you know, high and mighty about it, but, you know, from the standpoint of just like justice, you know, we shouldn't have 20% of the country believing in this crazy stuff, you know, it's just not right. And it offends me on that level. Um, you know, as a, as a political matter, I think um, many people do believe it. You know, this is anecdotal, but I think if you've got, um, you know, if any of you have friends in the States, everybody I know knows, truly, everybody I know knows someone, or at least knows someone who knows someone who was maybe a Democrat or maybe a middle of the roader or maybe a, you know, a Republican, but didn't really like Trump and, you know, someone who maybe liked George W. Bush or, you know, something more like that, who absolutely believes by now wholeheartedly that Hollywood and Jeffrey Epstein and the Clintons and the Democratic Party are in some way in cahoots to um, control the world and let sex traffickers um, run, run rampant. I mean, it's, it's crazy and it's horrifying. And I, I'm thinking of specific people in my life who, not a close friend, someone I used to see at weddings and stuff like that, who I, I had to block on you know, Facebook and Instagram because all of a sudden, over the course of the past year, it's it's like Epstein and, and QAnon conspiracy theories. So it's yeah. horrifying. Um, and I think it affects people's lives. It affects families. I mean, I, I have friends who are on, you know, sort of non-speaking terms with their parents because of this stuff. So anyway, um, I also think it, it winds up um, pulling the whole Republican Party to the right, because I think the farther right their rightmost flank is, the farther right their center goes. And so, you know, that allows someone like, um, Lindsey Graham, everybody's least favorite Republican, to say, you know, I'm not for QAnon, but I am for, you know, something absolutely horrible. And so, you know, I think it 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 pulls the whole party to the right um, and makes the gap between the two parties even even bigger. And um, you know, means um, that whenever they do regain uh, the presidency, and and um, you know, I think they'll have the Senate for most of the future of my life. So, you know, the House will be tricky. They'll, they'll almost always have the Senate, in my opinion, and they'll have the presidency from time to time. You'll have a party that's gone even farther to the right because their right fringe, um, you know, has, has, has exercised pull on everybody. And I think that's um, a, a tragedy, a political tragedy and also a human tragedy. I mean, I really mean, I'm not trying to sound sort of whatever, um, cheesy, but you know, like, if you know, I'm thinking of my closest friend who doesn't speak to his parents because they believe in stuff that he can't listen to. You know, that's not that's not good. And and, and um, you know, and I think Fox is to blame for that, and Facebook is to blame for that, and um, it's a it's a utter tragedy in the country, in my opinion. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll see if we I'll see if we can do this uh, after the session. But um, on the subject of queuing on hope not hate, which is an organization that Teddy knows well. Um, they've done some really interesting work on the, the degree of hold that, that some of those theories have. And one of the, the most frightening things was a third of all Americans did believe that there was a cabal in Hollywood and in uh, New York financial circles that was involved in child trafficking. So, I mean, that's an extraordinary finding about how something from a fringe can kind of go, go mainstream. Um, and I think, sorry, can I say one other thing about that? I think yeah. it's important to note that that um, elect, elected officials believe this stuff too. You know, I think there's been this debate in the country for the past four years, all these Republicans who used to, you know, be normal, um, you know, to what extent have they lost their minds and to what extent are they catering to the Trump base and they're just being cynical or, you know, they're saying stuff uh, in, in public, but in private, they're saying, I can't believe, you know, where the party's gone. And I think more of them than we think have lost their minds because these are just human beings. They watch Fox News at night uh, and in the morning. Um, they are surrounded by their friends and friend groups are highly um, um, uh, uh, polarized as well in the country. So if you're a Republican senator, it's a, it's a very good bet that almost all of your friends and your staffers and everybody obviously are Republicans. And so, you know, the, the voters believe this stuff, but so do the electeds. And so I think you know, when you look at like in the past couple of weeks, why is it the Republican senators um, can't admit that, that Biden has won the election? Because they're not sh sure he has, because they, they, they too have been taken down this rabbit hole. Um, and that's really dangerous. You know, it's, it's dangerous. It's, I'm not sure which is worse. It's obviously dangerous if they've got their heads on straight and are catering to a rabid um, base and they don't have the guts to do anything differently. But I, you know, I think it's maybe more dangerous if they're if they've moved, you know, to, to, to the to the fringe along with the with the base. And I think that explains um, 
that explains their behavior, right? You know, I, I take their behavior at face value. They believe the things they say, and you know, they've been radicalized along with their own voters. Interesting. Um, before we move off, uh, off this subject and move on to some others, you know, to what extent do you think the Biden campaign was helped by? You know, there was a lot of pressure on Facebook and on Twitter about their role in spreading disinformation in 2016, and to what extent? To what extent do you think that some of the controls that they put in place kind of uh, helped stop the spread of similar disinformation this time around? The, uh, they Facebook and, and Twitter. Yeah, um, a very lim limited extent. <laughs> I mean, I think um, you know, um, t Twitter did some. You know, I mean, I think it's not a it's not a coincidence that like QAnon isn't quite uh, the thing on Twitter that it is on Facebook. Um, Facebook did very, very little and um, also made some, you know, they're, they're very opaque. Um, so we don't always know what, how their system works, but appear to have made some algorithmic changes that allow certain kinds of disinformation to fester even worse. So, um, and not just algorithmic changes, platform changes. So, you know, they've, they've really um, elevated groups within the platform and groups are, you know, pretty much anything goes. And so, you know, I was speaking to someone about this the other day, there's, groups of hundreds of thousands, millions of people, um, in some cases, um, you know, who don't believe in vaccines. Um, and, you know, um, it's happening within the closed confines of a group. So, you know, it's not getting viral in the same way you have to join the group, but millions of people um, do. And that's, you know, like dangerous and about to be really dangerous as we fight what I imagine is going to be a very difficult fight to get people to actually take the COVID vaccine once we once we have it. Um, so you know, not 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 much. I mean, in, in my opinion, I'm, I'm I'm pretty critical of these companies. In my opinion, it's not that um, difficult. Sure, they have to allow people to express themselves. You know, um, uh, but I think that's a that's a bit of a red herring argument from them, as or an excuse to to do very to do very little. And the fact of the matter is, their own terms of service. Um, you know, um, suggest that they want to create healthy, um, you know, healthy platforms. And if you're logging in to Facebook, again, I mean, the, 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 the mono feed nature of Facebook, I think is hugely important because on television, you know, you can turn on Fox, but you've got to hit the channel, you know, on Facebook, I, I'm logging in to see whose birthday it is, or, you know, just see what's up and, you know, see who's posted a new photo. And I'm being hit with, you know, with this radicalizing, perhaps misinformation, um, you know, that I didn't ask for. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it strikes me that it would be fairly easy for them to say, you know, we don't, we don't tolerate anti-vaccine speech here. We certainly don't give it an algorithmic boost. We don't tolerate QAnon here. We certainly don't give it an algorithmic boost. And, and they haven't done that. So I, I don't give them very high marks at all. And I think to the extent that the Biden campaign was, was, was successful, you know, um, first of all, they, they won by a healthy amount, but not by much. I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, a, a normal, competent administration against, uh, against you know, s someone who should lose by, by 50 points. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of them is that I think, um, you know, the social media companies um, ha haven't, haven't done much to sort of um, um, sanitize the, the discourse in the country. Um, we've got kind of uh, uh, 20, 30 minutes um, uh, to go. And there's, there's quite a few questions about just your own personal story, uh, Teddy. So I'd like to get, get onto them in the, in the final section. But before we do that, um, you're very thoughtful about the role of you know, technology in society and how it's used you know, by candidates or by brands or what have you. And I remember uh, sitting with you in Chicago in the 2012 election when you were showing me this um, uh, prototype of an app that you were gonna have, which was gonna make um, uh, fundraising just like so it's like one one touch um for fundraising and that's when the penny dropped in my head that if you know if 2008 was like the email election then 2012 was going to be the iphone election i guess 2016 you know was that in steroids are there any kind of you know future emerging technologies or platforms that you that you look at and say well that's going to be you know that that's going to be potentially very interesting or do you think it's just a more of a playing playing out of existing of existing trends somewhere in between i mean it certainly won't be the latter i mean i think it would be it would be it would be silly to bet on you know bet against technological change and social change and, and innovation um i do think that we're in a bit of a sort of a fallow period in 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 um technological change i mean 
you know, in, um, you know, in the sort of Obama era or the, you know, the sort of um, the, the, the period preceding his, his couple of elections, so let's say, you know, 04 to 12 or something, you know, you had um, in pretty rapid succession, um, you know, social and mobile technologies uh, uh, emerging um, together and advancing each other in, in, in certain ways, but, you know, two, two, two related but separate you know, world-changing, um, life-changing, you know, day-to-day life-changing, um, you know, technological um, disruptions. I don't, I, I hate to use that word, yeah. but anyway, disruptions. Um, you know, and um, we're not exactly in that same kind of period right now. You know, I think like there's focus on autonomous cars and, you know, those will presumably, um, you know, be safe enough to drive at some point. Um, you know, uh, I think many people thought that augmented reality and virtual reality would be here by now. Um, I mean, they are in certain ways, but we're not all wearing goggles just yet. So, you know, I think um, obviously, you know, it's it's been a few years since we've had something of the scale of social media and mobile phones to kind of change all of our lives. So that will happen, but it's but I don't think we're in quite the same period of um, you know of just sort of rapid fire change that we were in. Um, 10 years ago. Um, that doesn't mean everything is stable. So for one, there will obviously be changes, including some that I have no idea what they are. Um, um, and two, you know, the social landscape continues to change. The media landscape continues to change. I mean, you know, TikTok, um, for instance, didn't exactly change the outcome of the election, I don't think, but it's like a really big deal and everyone's on it. And, you know, yeah. that that's, that's a big deal. And, um, you know, um, Facebook continues to change. And, you know, while it's, um, it is, you know, it, that's not a new company, changes to it are a big deal. So, you know, I think, um, of course, the 2024 election is going to look very different technologically than the 2020 election. I'm not sure it looked as different as, let's say, 08 did from 04, yeah. you know, because you had social media. You know, I'm not sure we'll see something of quite that scale in the next yeah. four years. Well, Peter, I hope that an answers your question. And you've also uh, asked another good one here, which is how has the significance of digital aspects of political campaigning changed over your lifetime? And you, you must have you you must have seen this a lot, Terry, with it moving from the fringe to the center. It'd be interesting if you just talked about your experience on different campaigns and yeah. I mean, you know, so my first campaign as a as a as a staffer uh, was Obama 08. And, you know, I used to rattle off these, um, these stats all, all the time. And now it's been a few years since I have. So I hope I get them right. But anyway, you know, um, Obama started running in February 07. Um, Facebook had been around since 04, I think it is. But it wasn't until uh, something like November 06 that it opened up. You, you used to have to go to college to be on it. And then you could be college or high school. And it wasn't until November or thereabouts of 06 that you didn't need to have a .edu email address to get on it. And so Obama starts running in February. Let's say I'm right, hopefully close to right, that this happened in November of the pre preceding year. You know, we're only three months into adults being able to be on Facebook, you know? Um, and now obviously the fact that all the adults got on it is why the kids left. Um, you know, Twitter was like, it, it was around, you'd probably heard of it. You almost certainly weren't on it. It was, a, you know, it was in use in Silicon Valley. I'm talking February, 2007. Um, and, you know, some journalists were beginning to mess around with it, but it certainly wasn't the media journalism yeah. behemoth that it is today. Yeah. Uh, even mobile phones, the iPhone came out in April or May of 07. So that's after the campaign has launched. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, the Internet's been around for, for a couple of decades at that point. And email has been around and certainly the Dean campaign in 04, you know, famously raised a whole bunch of money on email. But, you know, you're talking about, you um, you know, social and mobile um, technologies that were in their infancy, totally in their infancy, um, you know, in 07 and, and 08. So it was a completely different world. I mean, you know, for, for one, you, you thought of it as a tool to reach young people. Um, many Democrats still do, which is a, um, a depressing thing. But, you know, at that point, everybody thought that and they weren't wrong. Um, you know, um, you could, you know, you could raise a whole lot of money, but it, but it didn't begin to I mean, you know, now it's the bulk of the money. Um, you know, there were ways in which you could organize people, you know, in 08, we sort of famously at the time had this website, mybarackobama.com, uh, where you could create an account and, you know, connect with people and have a blog and whatever. But, you know, nothing like what we see today with millions of people sending texts into Georgia and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, so it's, it's difficult to even compare. Um, you know, I think, 
where digital ought to be in campaigns is not where it is in campaigns, at least not in the democratic side. So I think it ought to be at the absolute center of campaigns, especially now as we you know, are essentially all at home in front of our screens all the time because of the pandemic. Um, so I still think it's a bit of a battle. You know, it's it's often a battle for the digital people to get into the senior most spaces. And you know, old habits die hard. People, you know, want to. You know, the, the the first place you spend media dollars is is TV. You know, when you think about an announcement, you're often thinking, you know, how do you give it as an exclusive to the time New York Times or, or whoever. So it's a little hard to break those old habits. But I think increasingly, hopefully. You know, campaigns are are realizing like you know, actually maybe you should make that announcement by way of a you know Facebook event or something you know, and you can you can do an entire convention on Zoom and have it be a huge success and and all that kind of stuff. So it's a whole it's it's just a it's just a whole different world. I mean, I hate to give a sort of a, a vague That's answer, but it's just so so different. Fascinating. Years ago. Um, turning now, you know, you've been reported in the press recently as um. Uh, speaking to people in the Labour Party about what, what can be learned. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, don't believe anything that's in the press. Uh, it is um, true. I didn't realise that was going to be reported in the press, but it is yeah. true. I'll send you a link. Um, Jack Ewing asks a great question. Um, he says, what can the UK Labour Party learn from the Biden campaign in terms of communication and wider strategy in order to win the next UK general election? And I, could I broaden that out a little bit as well? No doubt there are budding politicians on this call. And uh, so if I could have a supplementary, what advice would you give them about how they use digital media? Okay, so that's a very big question. And I um, hesitate to pretend I know how to win an election in a country I don't live in, ha having not always won elections in the country that I do live in. But, you know, I think, um, I think the Biden campaign has given us sort of a, a, a master class on defeating um, right-wing extremism. So I'm going back a little bit to where we where we yeah. just were. But I think, you know, you all have a prime minister who, um, you know, if I had to pick between him and Trump, I'd pick him, but it's not as close a call as, as, it, as it, you know, ought to be. Um, and, you know, I think, like I was thinking about this, um, you know, in, in preparation for this event, you know, one, one of the things I think is very kind of bedeviling about politics here is the right has, has weaponized the far left against the center left in a way that the left has not successfully weaponized the far right against the, the center right. By which I mean, we take so much water for activists in the street saying defund the police, when by the way, that's not even what our elected officials say by and large. Whereas yeah. they emerge relatively unscathed, even though their own elected officials believe in QAnon and their own elected officials believe in stuff that's way beyond the, the pale of, you know, or outside of the Overton window of, you know, what used to be acceptable um, discourse. And I think the Biden campaign didn't exactly solve that, but they did figure out how to run a, um, you know, I said this at the very beginning of the conversation, run a campaign that welcomed in both the far left and the center um, and, um, you know, didn't get distracted by misinformation or, you know, you know, ha having to defend every last activist who says defund the police or having to, um, you know, whatever, whatever, and, you know, um, defeated a, a right wing um, autocrat on their own terms on a, on a moral basis. As I mentioned, I think there could have been a little bit more on the economics of it, but, you know, on a, on a, on a moral basis. And so as I think about trying to defeat, um, trying to defeat Boris, um, you know, you know, certainly if you look at what happened with Corbyn, well, he didn't exactly, it didn't exactly go the way of the Biden campaign, you know, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I think if I were at labor trying to get a hold of Jenna Malley Dillon and, and figure out some lessons, that would, that would be where I would start, you know, what are the lessons about creating a left to center left coalition that is not too vulnerable to radical, you know, to sort of being made out as radicals by the right, um, but can contain the left nonetheless. And can go up against a you know an increasingly far um, right um, autocrat on, uh, on 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 our own terms rather than his, and and that I think is what the Biden campaign essentially did. You know, again, not not to the tune of a 60-40 win, but to a you know to a, to a pretty in a pretty handy way that I fervently hope um, Labor can you know can can accomplish the next time we've got a general election. Um, in terms of what budding politicians ought to do with digital. You know, that's, that's tr tricky, you know, it's, it's not one size fits all. And I think every rule of thumb in, in digital winds up turning out not to be true. You know, like I remember when people thought, 
you, you know, video content must be short, you know, and then Bernie Sanders in 16 would put out these like eight minute videos of himself talking about student debt relief with no production value whatsoever, him, you know, his hair unkempt, you know, in front of a white wall or whatever. And they'd rack up millions and millions of views because guess what? Most people in America have not heard a politician, you know, embrace absolute student debt cancellation or embrace, you know, essentially a, a, a democratic socialist um, agenda, Medicare for all. And so the content was good and was sort of indispensable because you can't get it everywhere. No, no other candidate for president is giving you that. No other senator is giving you that. Um, and it did not matter that the videos were long and didn't have, you know, soaring music behind them and, and all of that. Um, and so I think, you know, the the key thing is like, you know, how, how are you, how, how, like, how are you being interesting? You know, like the internet is a super crowded place and you're not just, if you're a politician, you're not just in competition with other politicians, you're in competition with, you know, sport, you know, football and, you know, cooking and pornography and whatever else may be, you know, maybe getting people's attention. And so, you know, you've got to be interesting and that's going to mean different things to different people. It can mean the content is short. It can mean the content is long. It can mean you're, you know, hyper authentic and live streaming your, you know, yourself, you know, as you cook dinner, it can mean you, you know, hire a Hollywood director and only do videos that way. But, you know, one way or another, you've got to be interesting. Um, and, you know, that's sort of the core of it. The other thing is you've just got to do it. You know, you've got to invest in it. You know, like I, after the sort of 2016 wars of what's with the Democrats and the internet, you know, I kept saying like, this is not rocket science, spend money on it, advertise Excellent. there, hire, yeah. hire a lot of people, you know, like, if you're, you know, if you're, if, you know, if your media budget is 10 to one TV to digital, it's not rocket science, fix that, you know, so, so just do it. And if you're, a, if you're a young politician or just a person who wants, you know, might become a politician in, in 10 years, but wants to at least leave the door open to that and, and have a, have a presence, you know, start posting stuff, start, you know, start, start doing stuff, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll learn from the, you'll learn from the results and, um, you know, find your voice and, and um, you know, figure out what stuff, stuff works, st starts to do well, but you can't just like, you know, you have to, you have, you know, it's like people always say the way to be a writer is to write, you know, like yeah. you just have to sit in front of a computer for a bunch of hours and, and, and write. It's the same with digital. The way to do it is to do it. Excellent. Excellent. I'm um, turning uh, attention to you and I'm very grateful for Izzy Triggs for being so, so patient with our question, which is, you know, just tell us a bit about your story. Izzy asked the question, how did you move into the digital side of campaign politics? Did you have a traditional political press team experience before being a digital director? So why don't you, you take us back as to, you know, from college and how you ended up where yeah, you've been. So I was um, an 07 um, grad in, in college. And so, as I, as I just mentioned, Obama started running in um, February of 07. So this is my, you know, final semester or senior year. And, um, uh, a friend of, I think on the day he announced, which is February 10th, a friend of mine said, you know, what, what do you think about going to volunteer for Obama? And I said, that's a great idea. Um, and you know, I, over the years, I've sort of changed the way I, I talk about this. Um, I'll, t I'll, I'll explain why. I used to say, gosh, I got so lucky. I, 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 I found a volunteer job with a um, staffer who wound up being able to make a hire. And I was so lucky that she wanted to hire me and also that friend, by the way. Um, and then I was so lucky that I got this and that promotion. And I guess I talk about it differently now because I realize, you know, it's not a coincidence that I'm a white man um, and that that stuff happened to me. So I, I just like to note that now in a way that five years ago, I don't think I was so aware of that dynamic, you know. Um, so, yeah, I worked hard. I did my best to be as smart as I could be and available and adaptive and all the stuff that you should be in a first um, uh, job. But also, you know, I think I think um, history is, is is littered with white guys getting promotions awfully fast and, and being perceived as someone who can take on more responsibility and, 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 and be a boss of people um, faster than their black female counterparts or whoever else. And, and it's no it's no coincidence, even though very often those black women are smarter and harder working. So anyway. Um, through some combination of, of luck and privilege, and of course, hard work, uh, I wound up getting a job offer. Um, uh, uh, I, that job wasn't initially in, in digital, well, we used to call it new media. I'm not sure if the students on the, on the Zoom remember that, but we used to call it new media. Um, so that job actually wasn't in new media, but at a certain point, the deputy COO said, I have a feeling, I, you know, I, I just had a lousy entry level job. And he said, I have a feeling you'd rather be doing something else. And I said, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I felt so fortunate to be there. There were 100,000 people who would have loved, would have done anything to have a paying job on the Obama campaign. Yeah. But 
you know, I said, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd be interested in a different job if there were one. So he goes and does whatever machinations and comes back a few weeks later and said, there's an opening on the new media team. You do have to interview for it. So, you know, I interviewed for it and did a writing test, you know, as an inter as a, you know, lateral move internally, um, got the job. Um, everyone probably, well, you, you might be too young to remember, but you've probably heard, you know, the 2008 primary between Obama and Hillary was a battle royale that went on and on and on and on and on. So we sort of had to make a new structure to handle this wild logistical challenge of people moving from state to state and competing in states that we've never really had, you know, we don't know anything about really and never really had competitive primaries there. So I became the head of new media for that sort of system of, of you know, sending people out to, to these states that we were competing in late primaries in and trying to figure out how to stand up a super quick um, organizing structure in Idaho and in Puerto Rico and South Dakota and these places that you might have thought the campaign would be settled before you had to really fight the primary there. Um, so that translated pretty well to, um, to being the head of new media for the battleground states in the general election. So similar job, except general election battlegrounds rather than contested primary states. So, you know, we had people in 25 states, exactly. Um, you know, the, as I, I said in, in response to the previous question, the internet was a different place back then. So, you know, um, what it meant to do new media in the battleground state was, you know, you controlled a state website for Barack Obama and you tried to have relationships with bloggers. The so-called blogosphere was a huge deal back then. And you tried to organize some online volunteers you weren't really doing social in the same way. And you, you, you know, you, so, you know, it was, it was, it was different. Um, after the election, I came back to New York where I uh, live uh, and I'm basically from, uh, more or less from, and, uh, and didn't really have the idea of doing the second Obama campaign. I, I didn't really perceive myself as a lifer in the way that it turned out that I, I became. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a job that I really liked. Um, I, I mean, not altogether outside of politics. I was working with some Obama people, but I really liked the private sector and, and sticking around in New York. And my um, boss from 08, who had been the new media director, you know, sort of starts joking that I'm going to go be his successor in 12. And I'm saying, no, Joe, you know, you know perfectly well, I'm not going to do that. You know perfectly well, I don't want to do that. And I remember there was a conversation right around the time that the re-election launched, um, so very late in the game, you know, where I said, Joe, like, you know, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, wait, you don't really believe that, do you? And I had this like, this like aha moment of like, oh, have I been kidding myself this whole time? Like, I guess I am, I am doing this. And so it, it's a rare event in my life where I just like absolutely flipped in, in, in a two second span and just had this like, oh, I'm, I am doing this, aren't I, kind of moment. So I go back to Chicago for the 2012 campaign um this time as digital director we were saying digital by then um and you know did some of the stuff we've been talking about on this zoom and after the, during the 2012 campaign i'd gotten to be very close with stephanie cutter and jenna Malley dillon um and you know when the um campaign and you know during a campaign you're not you're very sincerely not thinking about your next job yeah. i mean maybe some people are but you're really not if you're you know if you're halfway invested in the campaign you're just yeah. You know, it may sound like bullshit, but it's not. You're really not thinking about your next job. So, you know, the campaign ends. You know, I remember having, you know, like tearful goodbyes with Jen and Stephanie and hoping we would keep in touch and having no concept that we would, in fact, keep in very close touch. And um, and then over the winter, Stephanie and I did a little consulting. She had a consulting project and she needed digital help. So she brought me in on it and it went really well. And she said, you know, maybe we ought to partner. And I thought that meant, you know, doing more of what we had just done. You know, she'd get some projects, I'd get some projects. And, you know, so at a certain point, she says, no, no, I mean, like starting a company, like a, like a, like a real company. And I said, oh, God, I don't know about that. Because I was quite exhausted. You know, I was only 27. I had just felt like the weight of the entire world on my shoulders for two years, 200 employees or something like that, and $100 million to spend. And I just... Um, I don't know, despite it having been a triumph, you know, I mean, we won the election, I just... I was a little, I was a little traumatized by it, which is so weird because it was a win, awesome. but I just needed, I just felt I needed some time. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, so, um, you know, she calls again. I say, I, I haven't decided if you have to go start a company, you should just go without me. I'm not, I'm not ready to decide this. And then one day she calls and says, I don't know where you are on this, but Jenna Malley Dillon's on board too. And I said, oh, I'm in. You know, sort of actually, sort of like that moment before the re-election. So I just flipped. You know, I I, I just in, I just instinctively felt like that's a good couple of people to be attached to, and, and it could be a fun time. So we started this uh, we started this business uh, that I'm we haven't even really talked about, which is 
fine. The campaign stuff is more interesting. But we started this business that we're, that Stephanie and I are still at. Jen took the leave, obviously, to run the Biden campaign. Um, and, you know, it's now about 70 people. Um, it used to be between New York and D.C., although now we're scattered to in-laws houses and Airbnbs and wherever all around the country. And, um, you know, our, our idea was always to be um, you know, somewhat political, um, and but also corporate and nonprofit and foundations and stuff, and doing the same kinds of things we've done on the campaign, communications, digital advertising, um, and that's um, you know, and that's and that's what we've done. Yeah. Well, I mean, can, uh, and and you take on interns at, at Precision Precision Strategies as well, don't you, Teddy? We do, yes. A little bit fewer now during COVID than we uh, used to, but hopefully that'll um, that'll return. So yes, we do. Yeah. And uh, I've got two kind of final questions. Did you kind of, uh, did you teach yourself kind of coding? I mean, could, could, from memory, you got a liberal arts, you know, background. How did you? Yeah, no, I didn't even teach myself coding. I mean, at one point I taught myself like very basic HTML, but no, um, my inroad was always, yeah, liberal arts. I was an English major in college. Um, my writing was, I mean, my, that first job I had in the new media department was as an email writer. And, um, yeah. and so writing and to some degree, you know, just sort of creative in general was always my, um, my, um, you know, my angle. So, you know, there's digital is a word that means so many different things. And yeah. you know, like one of the weird things about the job that I wound up having in 12 and in, in, again in 16 is, you know, um, you're, you're overseeing writers, which in my case, I felt like I knew how to do. You're overseeing data people, which in my case, you know, I'm, I'm not like a complete data idiot the way that some English majors are, but I don't have the skill set, you know? You're overseeing engineers. You're overseeing videographers. You know, maybe you have opinions about what makes a good video, but like, could, could, could you get into Final Cut yourself? No, I can't, you know, you're overseeing designers. And so um, almost anyone who's gonna be a digital director uh, or digital strategist or whatever is gonna be only one of those things and, and, and gonna find themselves having to figure out how to manage the other ones of those things. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's a real, um, that's a real task. But anyway, you know, everyone's got that same task. It may look a little bit differently, but if, if I had been a, a coder, I would have had to learn how to oversee the creatives. And instead I was more of a creator having to oversee the, the coders and the data people. And what many people may not know about you is you're actually a serial entrepreneur. So not only have you set up uh, precision strategies with um, uh, uh, Jen and Stephanie is you, you're also the proud owner of a very good burger chain called the Black <laughs> Burger uh, Company, which is once we can all travel again, you should definitely visit. It's got a couple of sites yeah. here in New York. What, what made you get into the burger business? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think ambivalence is like a running theme in my professional life. And so, you know, like I said, I, I didn't I didn't really foresee myself as a political lifer. And so I had this sort of joke, you know, I mean, I wasn't dead serious about it, although I was drawn, I was very drawn to it, that I would retire young and open up a bar. And I said that to a family friend, and I should note, I noticed that my mom is on here somehow. So hi, mom. Um, I don't know how you found oh, the so here. <laughs> so anyway, I said to, what's his face, Rick Davidson, <laughs> that, um, that uh, you know, my real dream was to retire young and open up a bar, which again, I wasn't like, totally serious about. So he says, well, you should meet my friends who do bars and restaurants. So I meet these guys. Um, they were working on uh, a bar concept at the time, but they were trying to raise like $2 million or something. And I, that was nowhere close to what I had in mind. And I didn't love, you know, they walked me through the creative concept and I didn't love it. And I didn't love the neighborhood. So I passed on that. And then um, let's see, a few months later, they sort of reappear. These are friends of friends. I mean, I don't even know them. Um, you know, they say we're, we're working on something different. Let us know if you want to talk about it. And it's, um, oh, I've, I've just received a text and my dad is watching too. Hi, dad. Um, so uh, I truly don't know how you found this link. Um, so uh, anyway, they had a new concept. This one was a burger joint, which wasn't really my thing. I wanted a bar and I'm not even, I don't, I mean, I could go a year without eating red meat and I wouldn't even notice it. I don't, yeah. It's not even really my thing. Um, but the, deci the deciding factor was they, they, you know, they wanted much less money, the creative concept was cool, all that. Um, uh, but also I did like a taste test and I thought the burgers were bad. And so I sent the chef a note saying, look, I'm not in this business, I barely even eat burgers. Here's my two cents, I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't do that and I, I might've done this or that, you know, and I'm, hopefully you don't find this terribly obnoxious, but anyway, that's what I thought. And he wrote back saying, this is really good feedback. We're actually going to use all this. And so I just thought that was cool. Um, and that's when I decided I could do this. So um, 
I think I was the first investor in it. I don't own all of it. I, I wish I did because it's quite successful. But um, you know, I just own a, I just own a slice of it. Um, and it's been this wild success, not really because of the burgers, but because of these milkshakes. Do you know that? I think you know about this, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So at a certain point, we started selling these ridiculous sort of Instagram friendly milkshakes that are this high and studded with candy and and whatever. Um, and BuzzFeed did a piece on them. And I've been accused of engineering that story because I have a bunch of friends at BuzzFeed. And in fact, no, I noticed it on BuzzFeed.com one day. I, that, so, you know, I don't, I don't know how they decided to do that story. But anyway, it goes viral. And then the next morning, Good Morning America is there. And the morning after that, you know, whatever, uh, who, you know, USA Today is there and God knows what. And, and so, you know, there have been like lines out the door. Obviously, now is not a great time for the restaurant industry, but there have been lines out the door ever since. Yeah. Um, due to, and I feel like it's so funny because it became the social media sensation and occasionally people have said, oh, you, you know, you must have engineered the social media strategy for that. And I'm like, no, really not. I, I gave some negative feedback on burgers and the rest, you know, kind of, the rest kind of happened um, without much involvement from, from me. Well, Teddy, I mean, it's been an absolute delight talking to you and um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Goff, you should be very proud of your boy. <laughs> um, uh, you know, from marketing a president to marketing a burger, you've got a genius touch, Teddy. And so I'd just like you to thank you for spending the time that you've uh, spent with us. And um, if there are any questions that the that, that students have, I mean, do um, uh, drop, drop us a note. And yeah, I'm very responsive. You can find me. I'll, I'll respond. Okay. And uh, as David knows, I desperately wanted to do this in Glasgow, and I will one day make you we, have it in Glasgow. <laughs> well, it'd be great to 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 invite you um, to the wonderful city of Glasgow again. So we once COVID is over, um, so I'm going to hand back to Kez. But thanks ever so much, Teddy. I really appreciate thanks, it. David. Thanks, David. It's my job to try and uh, offer some kind of profound reflections on what we've learned over the past 90 minutes. But right now, I can't think past these milkshakes but for a second. So apologies for that. It's nearly dinner time uh, here in Scotland. But Teddy, it's been really fabulous to spend 90 minutes uh, in your mind and to learn a little bit about the early signs of success that you've had in countering levels of disinformation and fake news. Also exploring the difficulty of nuance and uh, rational arguments on digital platforms. That's particularly fascinating to us at John Smith Centre. We've covered the role of psychology and elections and the battles that are still lie ahead in terms of taking on QAnon and how we rebuild tolerance and respect for views that are different for, from our own uh, on the internet and in political debates more broadly. David, we remain especially grateful to you for bringing not one but two fantastic standout guests uh, to the John Smith Centre. And Teddy, thank you so much once again for your time. And indeed, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Please tell your friends about us and we hope to see you next time at a John Smith Centre event. Thanks very much and good night.